let's begin by looking at the introduction to what is sociology. So we're going to begin first by looking at so sociology, what is it, and where were some of the founding foundations of where sociology sort of came from. So we're going to begin there, and then the second part will be more looking at chapter two, we're looking at it as science. And so we'll begin by looking at some of the historical perspective and also the current perspective about where sociology is. Sociology is the systematic study of human society and social interactions. Now sociologists study human societies and their social interactions in order to develop theories of how behavior is shaped by the group life and how on the other hand group life is affected by individuals. So, as you may be wondering, well, why do we bother studying sociology? Well, sociology helps us get a better understanding of ourselves and our social world. It enables us to see how behavior is largely shaped by the groups to which we belong and by the society in which we live in. The discipline assists us in understanding ourselves and our social world, and our worlds are created by us as well as being created by us. So sociology takes us beyond the personal um, perspective and assists us in gaining insights into society and the larger world order. It enables us to understand and un analyze the societies in which we live. So by definition, society is a large social grouping uh, and it shares the same geographical territory and is subject to the same political authority and dominant cultural expectations. Now this next term I want you to be familiar with is global interdependence. Now you can consider this in light of what's been going on in the world lately with either the new president of the United States, Donald Trump, or through North Korea and its expansion of its warheads, or any other part of the world. It's considering a world view, social issues in one part of the world affect another. This can include not only what, we've just, what I've just mentioned, but environmental problems, war, conflict, famine, AIDS, economies. The others that can affect Canada, well, the U.S. and Mexico in the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, which is currently being renegotiated, and in many others, other uh, relationships can be affecting Canada. The relationship in which the lives of all people are intertwined closely and any one nation's problem is a part of the larger global pattern. Now you'll see on page six in your textbook um, the, the common sex knowledge and uh, more often it's based on belief rather than facts. So take a chance to review that and get familiar. The discipline of sociology assists us in the understanding of ourselves and our social world. Our worlds are created for us by others as well as being created by us. Now an important element of sociology is that what's called sociological imagination. Now sociological imagination by definition is the ability to see the relationship between the individual persons and their experience and the larger society and how the two interact and play upon one another. Now in dividing the two there's personal troubles these are the private troubles that individuals and the networks of people which are they associate with experience on a daily basis. Now this can include things like homelessness, unemployment, divorce, family violence. Being unemployed or running a, a high credit card could be identified as personal trouble, overspending. Now alternatively, there's public issues. Now these are matters beyond the individual's own control. Uh, they're caused by problems originating at the societal level. Homelessness, unemployment, divorce, and family violence. Notice the similarity between the two. Using the sociological uh, imagination, scholars link personal troubles with public issues, societal overspending, dysfunctional social conditions, so sometimes the issues are related to outside issues affecting individuals and other times it's individual issues affecting society. Now we can also look in terms of a global social imagine, sociological imagination. In today's world keeps studying 
uh, in today's world keeps the study of just one society and much to a limiting in today's world. With globalization and interdependence and rapid change, it's difficult to see the world as being isolated from one another. Now we're going to look at what the division for high income countries, middle income and lower income, income countries are. And this is a graphic from your textbook and I'll demonstrate another graphic that looks at the division of countries as well. High income countries like Canada, US, Australia, Japan and a lot of Western Europe are high income or developed countries. These are countries with highly industrialized economies. They're technologically advanced industries involve administration and service occupations, and they're relatively high uh, levels of national and personal income. There's lower death rates due to good nutrition and medical technology. Now, this also doesn't exclude that there's lower incomes and social inequity that exists in these areas, but it's not as big as in some of their other areas. Now, middle income like um, Brazil and Mexico, for example, they're middle income countries. These are countries that are industrializing in their economies. They're particularly in the urban areas they are and the moderate levels of national and uh, personal income. So they're moving in the direction. They have pockets of industrialization, but they still have a lot of um, Argarian um, um, areas in which they worked as well. Now the lower income, many of the nations of Africa and Asia, and in particular China and India, are considered lower income in developing um, or developing countries. They're primarily Argarian, that's agricultural, and have little industrialization and low levels of national and personal income. Now, even though in those lower incomes, you will find in some countries like India and China, where they'll have very robust and industrialized cities, it doesn't represent the entire country. Most of the early thinkers and philosophers uh, who thought about human behavior more in terms of how things ought to be rather than the way things are. Um, the advent of modern day in the 19th century at least saw a shift to observe how people live their lives to better understand how they think and to do that systematically in, an, in order to verify. So there was a couple of terms that, enter, that entered into things in terms of understanding um, globalization and one of them was called industrialization and this is where there's a change of the means of production for how people make a living when societies were transformed from dependence on agriculture and homemade products to an emphasis on manufacturing and related industries urbanization is the other term and this is the process by which an increasing number of the population lives in cities rather than rural areas and many people move from being producers to being consumers. And as a result, new social problems emerged. Inadequate housing, unsanitary conditions, poverty, pollution, crime, low wages. Now we find urbanization to be a powerful um, movement in Canada. 80% of the Canadian population lives in cities. That wasn't the way it was, you know, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago. And of that 80% living in cities, 60% of that lives in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. If we think about some of the early thinkers, a concern with social order and stability was paramount in terms of the early thoughts. Natural scientists had been using reason or rational thinking to discover the laws of physics and the movement of the planets. Well, the social thinkers of the day began to believe that by applying the methods developed by the natural sciences, they might discover the laws of human behavior and apply these uh, laws to solve social problems. Some of the early um, thinkers, and this is you know early to the middle 19th century, uh, such as Auguste Comte, Harriet um, Martineau, uh, Hebert Spencer and Emil Durkheim were interested in, an, in, ad, in analyzing social order and stability. To begin with, Auguste Comte, uh, positivism was his perspective, a belief that the world can be best understood through scientific inquiry. Now, Comte, he believed that objective, bias-free knowledge was attainable only through the use of science rather than religion, which was a huge change for the time. Now, Harriet Martineau, 
uh, she advocated um, racial and gender equality. Now, she analyzed how large-scale social structures influence the lives of people, particularly women, children, and those who are marginalized by virtue of being uh, criminal, mentally ill, uh, disabled, poor, or alcoholic. Now, that sort of put a different spin on the way that they looked at social problems. Herbert Spencer, well, he constructed the evolutionary perspective of social order and social change. Societies developed through a process of struggle, you know, the struggle for existence and fitness for survival, which he referred to as survival of the fittest. Used to justify the repression and neglect of the minority groups in the late 19th century and beyond, known as the scientific racism. Now, Emile Durkheim, we'll revisit him later, Durkheim is a crucial figure in the development of sociology as an academic discipline. Uh, promoted the scientific approach to examining social facts that lie outside the individual. The founding figure of functional theoretical um, tradition. One of Durkheim's most important contributions to sociology was the idea that societies are built on social facts. Social facts are patterned ways of acting, thinking, and feeling that exist outside of any one individual, but that exert social control over each person. Now, Emile Durkheim, he coined the term anomi. Now, anomi is a condition in which social control becomes ineffective as the, rest, uh, as the result of loss of shared values and a sense of um, purpose in society, when people become disconnected. We, we started with some of the early thinkers. I want to move towards another sort of direction of those early thinkers. And we can look at Karl Marx, where he analyzed the struggle between capitalist class and the working class. And he called this class conflict. He mentioned about the bourgeois. The bourgeois were the capitalist class. These were the people who owned and controlled the means of production. The proletariat, on the other hand, were the working class. And they must sell their labor because they have no other means to earn a living. As a result, alienation, which was the exploited worker, would feel a sense of powerlessness and estrangement from other people and themselves. And they believed that the society, he believed that society should not just be studied, but should also be changed because the status quo is oppressive to most members of society. And so from his perspective, that is Marx, revolution will result from workers becoming aware of their alienation and wanting to have if you will, their more share of the pie. Now, Max Weber, who's also in the same sort of genre, he looked at sociology as having been value-free and should be conducted scientifically, including the researcher's personal values and economic interests. Now, he would say that sociologists should imply, uh, employ this Verstehen, which is German for understanding, to see the world as others do. The emphasis of value-free inquiry and the, and the necessity to understand how the world, uh, how, the, how others see the world was important insights into the process of rationalization, bureaucracy, religion, and many other topics. It was more, uh, he was more aware of women's issues than many other scholars in his day. Another, in terms of this movement towards modern uh, sociology, is George Simmel. He believed the main purpose of sociology was to examine the interaction processes within groups. He analyzed the impact of industrialization and urbanization on people's lives, concluded that class conflict was becoming more pronounced in modern industrial societies. Some more contemporary um, uh, theoretical perspectives. Um, Contemporary uh, uh, sociologists have various views on society. Sociologists endeavor to create theories to understand these views. Now, theories are sets of logical, interrelated statements that attempt to describe and explain and occasionally predict social events. Perspectives are points of views. It's like looking through different colored sunglasses 
and looking at the same things. They have a slightly different perspective on what's being seen, but it's still fact-based research methods that are the foundation of theory. Now in your textbook, you'll see sections for each of the different theories as they move through the, the chapter that apply this perspective or their perspective to shopping and consumption. You may find those sections really helpful to help you understand. Society is a stable, orderly system. Now the key figure here, as mentioned earlier, is Emile Durkheim. The basis of society and societal consensus of shared values, beliefs, and behavioral patterns, essentially like the glue that holds society together. Society has parts to uh, make up the whole and having each part having a function. So society is more like a living organism is this perspective. Structures such as family, politics, economy, healthcare, education, they all have function, they all have purpose. And these work together for the benefit of society. Telcott Parson, this is, um, he, um, he saw all societies must make provisions for meeting social need in order to survive. So he looked at what's called division of labor. And this is where he said the division of labor was necessary for the survival. And he described them as instrumental, which are an expressive roles. And they were necessary. The instrumental roles, well, this was leadership and decision making. And it was normally held by the husbands and fathers. The expressive, which would be housework and caring for children, providing emotional support for the family, well, this was typically uh, the wife and mother. Now, as you can probably imagine, this is a pretty um, to very traditional view of family or of society, and it certainly has been changing. R.K. Merton, well, his, he described what he, he, what he described were manifest function. These were functions that were intended or overtly recognized by the participants in a social setting. The latent functions, well, these were unintended. Uh, they're hidden or remain unacknowledged by the participants. Um, dysfunctions, as another term, these were uh, undesirable consequences of any element in society. Um, in education, for example, the manifest functions would be the teaching skills, the broadened awareness, the latent uh, functions would be the social networking we do and the lifelong friendships we establish. Social institutions, family, economy, politics, for example, these structures provide um, the society with manifest and latent functions. For their perspective, all institutions function with manifest and latent functions and therefore provide purpose for being. So in the more modern view, according to conflict, yes, according to the conflict perspective, groups in society are engaged in a continuous struggle uh, for control and scarce resources. This is where we talked about the importance of Karl Marx and Max Weber, where they introduced the bourgeois, the proletariat, um, um, and alienation as being key elements. Today's advocates of, of the conflict perspective, they view social life as a continuous power struggle among competing social groups. And part of what's important to understand about the more modern view is the introduction to the, of the term prestige, which is the positive or the negative social estimation of honor. Now there's different roles that are played in society. Some have higher prestige than others. Now, it's important to note that prestige is related to the roles, not the people. And so it, sometimes it generalizes pretty significantly, where some people are assuming some roles, but aren't that prestigious as a person themselves. Now, power is another term. This is the ability of a person in a social relationship to carry out what they want, despite opposition of others. So anytime that you impact somebody else and they can't, and don't have any power, if you will, to stop you, that's what's known as power. And so in conflict theory, having prestige and power puts you in an advantage over others. Now, the other term that's mentioned is what's known as the power elite, a small clique of comprising of basically top corporate people, political people, and military officials. Now, in the more modern use of that word instead of power elite is that one percent and we saw demonstrations being done a few years ago against the one percent. Now feminists their perspective focuses on the significance of gender in understanding and explaining inequities 
um, that exist between men and women in the household and in the paid labor force and in the realms of politics, law, and culture. Feminists highlight the role of patriarchy. It's the hierarchical system of power in which males possess greater economic social uh, privilege than females. Now there is a matriarchy, uh, that's where women are more dominant than men, and it's very unusual in cultures. And then the, the feminists sort of lean towards moving into egalitarian, which is a more equal balance between men and women within home, within labor, within politics, law, and culture. So these are areas that sociologists like Dorothy Smith have pursued to see, you know, how uh, we can direct, strive to have more egalitarian approach. But currently it's under patriarchy where in homes, for example, men tend to have more power and control than women and receive more benefits, whether that be through work and the benefits generated there or women who might be working also come home and do more work when they get home, raising the kids and looking after the meals. This is known as the second shift. Now, paid labor is another area of inequity. Men are paid more for the same work that women do, and women have been discouraged from working in what would be considered non-traditional roles, like in the military, in construction, science and technology. Now, where these are starting to change is in part because of the feminist perspective. In politics, women are not properly represented in politics, given the number of women that there are. In law, well, it wasn't until 1929 that women were considered by law to be seen as, per as people. And in culture, the things that are valued by a society and by a culture were predominantly male-driven. It's not until more recently that we see more examples of women representing Canada or representing a society as having made head road and gains and represent Canada. The Canadian women's hockey team is a good example. Now, functionalist and conflict perspective take a macro view. The feminists include both a micro and a macro view. Now, the macro view examines whole societies, big picture view, large scale social structures and social systems. Whereas the micro view, it focuses on small groups rather than large scale social structures. And one example of this is symbolic interactionalism. Now, symbolic interactionalists this is the only theory that we'll look at that has a micro perspective. They view the interaction between people and examines people's day-to-day -day interactions and their behavior in groups. They view society as the sum of all the interactions of individuals and groups. Important to them are what are known as symbols. Symbols are anything that uh, are meaningful and meaningfully represent something else. The sociological approach, this one, the postmodern, is, is the approach that attempts to explain social life in more modern societies that are characterized by post-industrialization, consumerism, and global communications. Postmodern perspectives are characterized by the decline in the influence of social institutions such as families and religions and education in people's lives, and more of the pursuit of individual freedoms the impact of information explosion, the rise of consumer society, the global village, the post-industrial society, and simulations. Now, the last of piece here I just wanted to draw your attention is in your textbook. If you want to see a snapshot based on these theorists, it will give you some heads up perspective about what to pay attention for and might give you a bit of a study purpose. Remember to use your textbook and make notes because you can use them for your test. All right, everybody. Good luck, and we'll see you in week two.